and podcast. Thank you again, by the way, for your time. I'm really appreciate it. And good luck. Here we go. Okay. Let's I, we'll wait for um Keith to come on. Um good afternoon, everybody. Ah, beginning to see participants filing in. So welcome to all of you who are um logging in. We are still waiting for uh, Keith to log in. I believe he's He's got the link, and so hopefully he'll pop up in a minute um, while we just wait. So welcome to all of those of who are still joining. Um, this is the final RDA pod, um, podcast, I want to say. Actually, the podcast is launching, well, it's launched, and it will be continuing next year. But this is our final webinar for 2022, and we've been so encouraged by um, the audience and the signups and the interest in the subject matter. And for that, I'm so grateful to the people who come on to the webinars, Catherine, Gabriella, Keith today, always giving their time and, and sharing their expertise. So while we just wait for um, some more people to join and sign up um, for today, just a few housekeeping rules. The webinar is being recorded. Um, we will put it on our website once we have finished today and um, we are going to endeavor to answer all your questions so please do put them in the question and answer session if you've got any questions type them up we'd be appreciative of that and I'm really delighted to be joined today by um, as I said Dr. Gabriella I never get your surname right good tears got it right that's great Okay, who is a assistant professor at um, King's Business School in London. And, um, and I have the delight of knowing actually Gabriella for a, quite a long time. I think we met in a conference, didn't we, Gabby? Quite a long time ago, talking about these issues. And equally, um, Catherine Bryant, who's the head of policy and programs of Walk Free, exceptionally um, experienced with lots of insights in this area. And I'm equally, um, equally pleased to have known you for a long time too, Catherine. Nice familiar face when we cross over in different places. And, and Keith, um, who by no means last but not least, who, who I'm hoping is going to be able to log on uh, very shortly, is bringing us um, his insights and experience as a survivor to today's discussion. Um, so I still see there's some more people that are signing up. Welcome to those of you who just switched on. And um, I hope you're going to enjoy today's session. I'm certainly looking forward to the insights. So I do feel a bit bad getting started without Keith having signed up yet. Um, and so don't mind me if I'm just going to check my um, WhatsApp and just check that he's OK with the link. Um, Sorry, I'm just going to send him another message. He did say he was busy trying to log on. But I think just in the interest of time for today, um, if you don't mind, we'll just get started and then um, I'll welcome Keith when he comes on screen today. So just um, very briefly, for those of you who um, have not met me previously, I'm Colleen Teran. I'm a tri-qualified lawyer and founder of RD International. We've um, a specialist business and human rights and sustainability consultancy, and we have um, expertise in modern slavery and have worked for the last 14 years supporting organizations across different sectors um, to address the modern slavery risk uh, to build their due diligence processes and to help develop uh, policies. And, and we embed legal compliance into all the work that we do. And this is just a snapshot of some of the organizations that we've worked with in the last few years. Now, for those of you who are listening today, I'm quite sure many of you are familiar with um, the, modern, the UK Modern Slavery Act. And, and perhaps even familiar with the um, Australian 
legislation, <clears throat> um, also an act on uh, modern slavery reporting. And I don't have an intention to really go into any depth into either of these pieces of legislation today. I think the only thing I want to flag is that its relevance to businesses under the UK Act is um, a section 54 transparency and supply chains provision. And there are reporting requirements for business to meet um, in relation to stating that they understand that where their risks are in their supply chain on modern slavery and importantly also in their organizations. And to demonstrate the due diligence that they are taking to address these risks. But it is only reporting legislation. And what I mean by that is it is um, legislation that you provide and statement that you update annually on a website, something that's publicly available, and you report on the steps you take. It is different to the kind of legislation we're seeing coming into the EU, and I, I will go on to that in a minute, which is much more focused on taking action and actually providing um, providing evidence that you are actually doing more than just simply reporting on something. Now, the Australian Modern Slavery Act, and um, I know Catherine is going to give us some insights as to how that might, you know, the, perhaps the difference in responses to companies and in both Australia and the UK. But the Australian Act takes a very similar structure to the UK, except importantly, that it is a mandatory requirement that the criteria set out in the Modern Slavery Act in Australia is met. So that means you have to report on each element of the criteria that is set out. And the UK and the Home Office for a number of years have told us that they're going to strengthen our legislation. They're going to um, create mandatory reporting criteria. And there's a number of other things they have purported or have said that they are going to do. Um, I've said to a number of the clients that I deal with and, um, and, and even on a training basis, that is quite boring for us as consultants and lawyers to tell people that the law is going to change and it still hasn't. And this is, this is, I think, since 2020, if I'm right, Catherine that they, and Gabby, that they set out the statement to change the law. But it is what it is. The, in the Queen's speech, again, there was a referral to it that we were going to see a change. But I do think it lends itself to the question of, you know, where are we being left in terms of the UK versus other jurisdictions globally, which are beginning to take a much stronger viewpoint on disclosure and enforcement and accountability requirements for business. That's really all I want to say about the Modern Slavery Act in the context of this, right? because you know, what we really want to be looking at today is far more around the company responses. And, um, and this is just a very basic sort of lumping together the kind of trends that we see in business around how how they react with um, companies responding to the Modern Slavery Act. You know, many companies will try and just be compliant, but we know that that's even, many, many companies aren't even meeting that. I think we've still got a less than 50% compliance rate in the UK in terms of reporting. Some companies are still, believe it or not, unaware that this law even applies to them. And, you know, I am a left aghast at that, um, particularly when you have legal departments that are supposed to track compliance, but we still find there are some companies that are unaware of it. Some companies are unable to deal with it. And I'm saying that, you know, that's quite a controversial question. Are you ever unable to actually put in place um, your legal requirements? But I think that sometimes I, I, we use that bracket where, um, there are distinctive cultural and um, compliance difficulties where you have parents and subsidiary companies and parent companies outside of the UK where they might just not culturally actually manage to do this. And I don't say that that's an excuse, but we see a bit of a trend of that. And then we have this huge distinction between companies that are unwilling to do anything and those companies that go beyond compliance into best practice. And, you know, I don't know, I mean, we can come back to this if we've got time, Gabby or Catherine, if you agree with those kind of categories, but that was, you know, just perhaps a very high level way of saying these are the kind of responses that we see to people addressing modern slavery and modern slavery in supply chains. Now, 
the the response to that sort of element of you know where companies are at or what they're doing has lent itself to what was needed in practice and in organizations to give companies some support on how to address these issues and we um, in 2020 um, a, a number of us were asked whether we would be willing to sit on a committee to develop a guidance standard around a modern slavery risk management and and um, and I was part of that Catherine Gabby and a number of others really incredible experts with very different areas of expertise who've spent over two years developing a standard um, to really help organizations think about how to address this issue and and I think there's a lot of things that we can be proud of I mean it's a very long standard it's very detailed but I do think that there are elements in it that are very unique um, that I haven't seen and I've I've been part of other ISO standard developments, um, you know, on sustainable um, development issues, sustainability. And what I really think is unique to this is the kind of emphasis that was brought in around culture, around it being victim victim centric, getting insights from survivors. Um, I think the cross cultural element in expertise was quite amazing, really. So the standard is really available you can download it if you can't find it on the bsi site there is a link on our website i think in one of my blogs if you just search bsi on the site um i'm not going to say very much about that i i do want to say from a, a legal perspective we added in some additional um, thoughts and and provisions around legal counsel responsibilities setting up legal compliance teams and I felt that that was really needed because what we do see in practice is that many lawyers um, are not really trained on these um, on this subject and they are very risk adverse because that is what lawyers are trained to do and they don't really possibly know a bigger picture around this so we we did build in some more um, particular uh, drafting on 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 that side of things so just conscious of time I just thought I'd pull out some key features on modern slavery due diligence. This is not um, in any way different to what you would see if you are building human rights due diligence frameworks. Um, it's built on the OECD guidelines and the UN guiding principles. But, you know, I think it's a reminder for companies to think about whether they have their policies in place and their statements. How do they assess and identify their actual, actual impacts and their potential ones? How do they cease, prevent, and mitigate their risks? How do they track the implementation and results? And importantly, how do they provide remediation? And then I felt that, you know, some of the things that we probably need to see more of is good governance and leadership and a, a victim-centric approach in, is, is, is definitely something that is being adopted as a best practice level now with companies starting to get the view of survivors in how they are dealing with certain programs. Um, I'll come back to that. Oh, sorry, that was just very, very briefly, just from our point of view, we've got lots of e-learning training masterclasses that are available on our website. Um, we are going to run a podcast in the coming year around some of these elements, particularly around modern slavery. So if you haven't signed up to our website, just do that and, and we will keep you in focus of, of what is there. So I'm going to stop and very happily hand over to Catherine. And Catherine, if you want to say anything more about your experience, please do so. And just let me know when I can move on to the next slide. Thank you. Thanks so much, Colleen. Um, and thanks everyone for, for joining today and to uh, inviting me along to talk about some of our research at Walk Free. Um, so Colleen introduced me at the beginning, but uh, my name is Catherine Bryant. I'm Head of Policy and Programs at Walk Free. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, uh, we are a research-based organisation that produces research or evidence for advocacy um, to really drive change uh, for governments and businesses. Um, before I dive into the presentation, I just want to reflect that the reason we're here today on the 2nd of December is obviously it's the International Day of the Abolition of Slavery. Um, and so this is commemorating the UN Convention for the Suppression of Traffic and Exploitation, including prostitution of others. Uh, but really the focus has become over recent years to focus on contemporary forms of slavery uh, but i do want to kind of acknowledge that you know so much of what 
makes up modern slavery today is actually driven by these inherited forms of exploitation. And we've seen that modern slavery itself has kind of evolved and changed in different ways, but there are still some more traditional, for want of a better way of putting that, forms of exploitation exist, such as slavery. Um, common to all of these different types of exploitation is this idea that people are living in situations that they cannot escape or cannot leave or refuse. Um, so as I mentioned, Wolf Free is a research-based organization. I'm actually gonna talk about um, two different research projects that we have um, today and over the next 10 minutes. Um, and so the first piece is the global um, estimates of modern slavery. Um, so this is the second edition of this report that we put out um, in partnership with the International Labour Organization and the International Organization for Migration. Um, we present within this report global estimates, as given by the title, uh, but also we do regional breakdowns, uh, gender breakdowns, age as well. And then for forced labour, we also include breakdowns by economic sector and form of coercion. Um, I'm going to focus very much just on the forced labour component given the audience and also in particular the forced labour exploitation piece. Um, so as you can see on the screen in front of you, we released the second edition in September of this year, and we estimated that on any given day in 2021, there were 49.6 million or nearly 50 million people living in some form of modern slavery. Um, of those individuals, 27.6 million were in forced labour, um, and 22 million were in forced marriage. Um, that forced labour component is broken down into what we call forced labour exploitation or forced labour, mainly relates to the private economy. Um, so our forms of exploitation that occur outside of state and post forced labour. And then we also provide an, an estimate of forced commercial sexual exploitation as well. Um, so when we look at that 49.6 million people, that, that roughly translates to one in every 150 people, sorry, one in one every 150 people in the world is experiencing some form of modern slavery in 2021. And if you shoot on to the next slide, please, Colleen. So as I mentioned, this is the second edition. So we were able to look at some of the trends over time and disappointingly and depressingly over the last five years, we've actually seen an increase in modern slavery across the board. Um, so 2016, uh, we found there was 40.3 million. This time around, it was 49.6. So There's an increase of roughly 9.3 or 10 million people. And this occurs across all forms of exploitation with the exception of state imposed forced labor. Um, so we're really seeing that there's a need now for urgent action to tackle these forms of exploitation. Uh, next slide. And I'll just state the global level one more slide and then I'll dive into the forced labour estimates. So we look at the breakdown by gender um, and age. So women remain disproportionately affected uh, by modern slavery across most forms with the exception of forced labour exploitation and state imposed forced labour. Although I will say there is still an overrepresentation of women in certain sectors, uh, such as the service industry and domestic work. Um, and then when we look at children, we find that children represent one quarter of that total of 49.6 million. If we, next slide please, go on. Um, so diving then into the forced labor estimates and the forced labor and the private, um, forced labor estimates overall, uh, we looked at regional breakdowns. Um, the most people in uh, forced labor are actually in the Asia Pacific region. Um, at 55% of the total. Um, in some ways that's not really surprising because obviously it's mo also the most populous region in the world. Um, so when we look at a proportion of the population, we actually see that the, uh, the proportion increases in the Arab states, followed by Europe, Central Asia, Americas, Asia the Pacific and Africa. Um, so the important thing to note here though is that modern slavery and forced labor in particular obviously occurs in all regions around the world. Uh, next slide. So then going from, uh, then looking at forced labor in terms of migration status, this is really drilling into that private, um, in, privately imposed forced labor or forced labor in the private economy. And we were, I mean, please is probably the wrong word for it, but we really wanted to look at migrant workers. We've, we've known and have known for a really long time that migrant workers are particularly at risk group uh, in terms of exploitation. Um, and so we were really pleased to, to look at the data in a lot more detail and we can now say, that migrant workers of adults or my adult migrant workers are three times more likely to be in forced labor than non-migrant workers. And migrant workers include, is those that have crossed an international border. We're not picking up domestic migrants at this point in time, or those migrating internally. But it really shows and really drives home that there is a real need from governments and from businesses to actually really reflect upon the fact that migrants are actually a particularly vulnerable group. And we need to make sure we have legislation and policy in place to respond to those. Uh, next slide. 
So we're also able to look at the economic sector. Um, four in 10 adults in forced labor exploitation in the private economy were found to be in the services sector, which includes domestic work or such things as hospitality, hotels, cleaning, et cetera. So that's a particularly vulnerable group and where women are disproportionately affected. Uh, we also then saw high levels of um, exploitation in manufacturing, construction, agriculture, mining and quarrying, some of the other sectors which aren't on the screen in front of you but uh, were included, also included fishing, which doesn't come under the agriculture umbrella, forced begging um, illicit, and illicit activities as well. And then on the next slide. We also then looked at the forms of coercion that were affecting those in modern slavery, in forced labour in particular. And um, so the most common form of coercion is withholding or non-payment of wages, followed by abuse of vulnerability, some form of, of uh, direct threat or some kind of financial penalty or debt uh, manipulation. We also look at the gender dynamics here. So you'll see that the yellow dots refer to the female experiences of these forms of exploitation. And um, so they're disproportionately affected with withholding or non-payment of wages, abuse of vulnerability, uh, physical violence, sexual violence, as well as threats against their family members. Um, there is no, um, it's not just one form, people could report multiple forms of uh, coercion, and actually in most cases we did find multiple forms of coercion were present. Um, when we do our surveys through the Gallup World Poll to produce this data, we also ask survivors of these forms of exploitation to reflect upon their experiences, so we were able to collect the description of their experiences in their own words. And so just a couple of examples on the, on the screen in front of you, these verbatims are what we then go and code to create the estimates. But you can see here, you've got things such as uh, the first person saying, I don't have a legal working permit, so can, can't tell the police. Then we've also got, I was forced to do excessive work due to debt or had to do overtime to clear this debt. This is where we can really start to look at the responses that we have, we should have to, to focus on what, and tackling forced labour. First one, looking at the importance of safe migration routes, which also points to the migrant workers being disproportionately affected. And then also the importance of the employer pays principle. So getting rid of recruitment fees, transport fees, travel fees, and people migrating for it to get a job, um, which shows us yet that we should be really focusing on these particular issues. Um, I'm just gonna point very quickly, so that's the global estimates of modern slavery, that provides the global figures and the regional breakdown. We then do go and produce the global slavery index, which provides national level breakdowns of this data, and that will be coming out sometime next year. I'm just gonna take just a couple more minutes just to focus on the last piece, because I know Gabrielle is gonna be focusing on this in a lot more detail, but if we just move on to the next slide, I'm just gonna change tact. Um, so the, the second piece of research that I wanted to point to is called Beyond Compliance. Um, and this refers to the, the piece of legislation that Colleen was mentioning in her opening remarks around the UK Modern Slavery Act and the Australian Modern Slavery Act. So we've been producing um, reports, assessing the statements produced under those two different pieces of legislation since 2016 for the UK and then this year for the Australia piece. Um, and we do this to try and champion accountability and also to inform our wider advocacy work. Uh, this, we focus very much on sectors. Uh, when doing this assessment. So we did a report in 2019 looking at, at hotel sector, financial industries in um, 2020, and then this year, the garment industry. And just to give you a bit of a teaser of some of the findings from that, uh, Colleen, if you uh, go on to the next uh, slide. So this is just looking at the, um, the garment industry. Um, so this is both Australia and the UK, although as Colleen mentioned, there is actually a difference between how companies are reporting under these two pieces. We tend to see that the Australian statements are a little bit stronger than their UK counterparts. And this is to do to things with such as the mandatory criteria that Colleen was talking about, and also that companies are having to put their statements on a uh, central registry, which we're still waiting for in the UK. Um, so we saw across the whole garment industry of about, about 100 companies, uh, Despite this, we're still seeing about a third of companies are not meeting mandatory publication criteria. They're still not putting things on their website. They're still not signed off by the CEO. They're still not approved by the board. Um, despite the garment industry being incredibly high risk, we found that 35% did not identify these risks, nor did the quarter actually disclose any information at all on their supply chains, which shows a lack of transparency uh, by these particular companies. And then finally, we also look at sector specific metrics, which is things that we think companies should be doing based on good practice and their experience of, of the last few years. So the garment industry we know was disproportionately affected by COVID. Lots of garment workers lost their jobs, were, weren't paid for, for work that was, um, that was pending. Um, but we, yet, despite that, we found that 43% of statements did not disclose anything that they were doing to provide additional support for workers 
in their direct operations or supply chains directly impacted by COVID-19. And then the final piece in the final slide, and then I'll pass back to Colleen, um, is we also are really pleased to uh, partner with the Clean Clothes campaign, who did surveys of factories who are associated with the brands whose statements we were looking at to see, you know, sometimes they have commitments in these statements around living wage, uh, paying a living wage to their supply chains, but looking at what the reality was in the factory on the ground. And we found that in about across average, across all of these companies that we we're able to get this data, there's about a 40% living wage gap, which means companies should be trying to, um, sorry, workers need to earn 40% more in order to meet their basic needs. So I think pulling all this together from both the, the global estimates and also the beyond compliance piece, I'm gonna leave you with unfortunately a bit of a bleak picture that we're seeing a real increase in modern slavery and still a real lack of action on both governments and also companies an awful lot more that needs to be done to tackle these forms of exploitation. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Colleen. Thank you so much, Catherine. That's so insightful. And, you know, I, I do think I'm so pleased we're still having, well, I'm not pleased. I'm pleased we're having the conversations about these things being brought to the fore because the research and what you're showing is really critical to the conversation. But I think that, you know, to see this kind of raise in numbers and, and actually the lack of inaction, both at a government and a business level, is, is really concerning because, you know, I, I completely see that we can't have this tackled by just business or just government or just the NGOs. But the inaction is, is I think, the troubling piece when, when you are looking at the impact to communities and, and to people and, and the way they are. So, so thank you for that, Catherine. And, we, and I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk more about it and um, perhaps more in the question answer session. And, and just to say, sorry, we, we are still having a problem with Keith trying to log on. I think there's a, a, a link issue. So we're trying to work in the background to see how we can help him with that. But I'm going to hand over to um, Gabrielle. And Gabrielle, if you'd like to um, say anything more about your work, well, please feel welcome and just let me know when to move to the next slide. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen, and thank you for the invitation. And uh, I, I guess, you know, why do we have international days to, uh, I guess, not celebrate? I guess we, we, we are raising awareness of lack of action. I guess it's part of that, you know, that we, we discuss these topics, that we debate those issues. So thank you for the invitation of, uh, for being here today to share some insights. So like Colleen mentioned already, I'm an assistant professor in international management. And my past research uh, has focused mainly on the making of global social responsibility standards in multinational corporations and all the tensions that arise with that, including that being responsible means various things for different people. Um, so I came from that background when I started researching modern slavery, really the early days when the Modern Slavery Act came into force. Um, and since then, I've been really interested in understanding why and how modern slavery is interpreted in very different way by different organizations, by policymakers, uh, by practitioners. So I did some research with our other colleagues um, in, uh, from the Rights Lab in Nottingham in the construction sector, and our research showed that the way in which modern slavery is defined and understood by organizations will have implications uh, into how those organizations respond to it. And I think the whole spectrum of responses that Colleen already presented and in, uh, early, to, early today. So I'm going to give you a little bit of more insight, hopefully, of you know, why are we seeing those, those responses. Next slide, Colleen, please. Um, and I think we already uh, mentioned these, both Colleen um, and, and Catherine. So it's been seven years since the introduction of Section 54 of Modern Slavery Act here in the UK. We know initially it was claimed as this leading piece of regulation, uh, but there's now recognition that it has not created the level, level playing field for businesses, nor driven these race to the bottom in terms of respecting human rights, as many, uh, including myself, had hoped. And I think one of the issues is that the, the act discharged this monitoring burden on civil society and, and, and other um you know, stakeholders to, to be uh, the ones watching and keeping accountability, those functions. Um, so this has been really ineffective driving meaningful responses. Um, and what we have seen uh, in, in our research is that 
Well, uh, Section 54 brought the issue into the spotlight. I think it, it has really reached uh, the boards of big businesses, but of course, re reporting has been one of the key preoccupation. And with that, I think there has been a lot of debate also uh, in, in the business community around what is really the purpose, what are the benefits, and what are the cost of compliance or not compliance with their reporting. I think uh, I have seen uh, in my field work really conflicting views on what reporting should achieve. I think there's this view that non-compliant firms should be punished through these blacklisting uh, or name and shaming mechanisms. Then there's all the view that, well, you know, instead of looking at those bad apples, maybe we should be rewarding those companies uh, through these name and fame mechanisms. But I think there's also the other perspective that, you know, rather than looking at, at, at rewards and, uh, you know, um, shaming mechanisms that perhaps we should create that atmosphere where companies should be able to provide that information in a more open fashion, you know, that is not about pointing fingers, but really making sure that that gets us, um, you know, uh, in the more effective responses. There are also the disputes uh, internal in organizations where we see, you know, who is taking ownership for these responses and, you know, if reporting is the key concern, you know, who is in the first place doing that reporting. And there are also, you know, I'm just adding, you know, to, to, to all these uh, contentions um, around the purpose of the statements. I think some argue that uh, they, they should be aspirational. So there are these pieces where, you know, companies where they should be going in the next years. But I think there's the call also that uh, companies should keeping it real, you know, reporting verifiable facts, um, and that's basically the basis for holding them accountable. But largely, and I guess that's the key point, and you know, of, of really outlining what are these debates is that these discussions have been largely disconnected to the development of solutions. So really, you know, the, the, it's, it's about the reporting, but not about the the action. Uh, next slide, please, Colleen. So I just wanted to highlight um, already Catherine uh, presented some a snapshot of, of really what, what is the advancement of uh, in, in terms of the reporting. And I'm also referring here not only to my work, but also there are other reports uh, looking mainly at FTSE 100 companies. Um, and what we find is that uh, we see that there's a patchy implementation in terms of a quality of the standard of, of reporting, where we see both pockets of good disclosure, but also areas of significant improvement. Um, and and um, this is from my research uh, recently, we've been looking longitudinally really having across the board. So the, the set of reports since 2016 to 2021. And we can confirm that, yeah, there's some degree of improvement in the amount uh, and quality of information, uh, but largely we see that statements are still very descriptive, very superficial. And I think Catherine already told us, you know, in which areas we, we find those um, weaknesses. But I think we, we are going a, a, a step further and really trying to relate uh, this information and reporting on other indicators and we're doing some initial uh, analysis on really how this uh, relates to ESG scores. And I will, you know, give one of the key findings that we've been really puzzled about this on, you know, why are we seeing this? But we basically find that high quality disclosure around modern slavery does not necessarily align with high ESG scores. And uh, I think this is, you know, Partly related to what I alluded to earlier, you know, these fears of reporting that perhaps those companies that are already, you know, taking steps, um, they are worried about, you know, how they may be perceived in the public, uh, you know, sphere by media, pick up by media, but potentially here where we see that those companies where we know they are lacking credentials in the, you know, broadly the social and environmental space, they may be overcompensating around modern slavery, that they may find, you know, this is something maybe we can jump on and, you know, maybe start building a reputation around this area, despite, you know, things like climate change is something that they completely, you know, are, are not uh, paying attention to. Uh, next slide, Colleen, please. And just going back to, uh, you know, why, why are we lacking collective action? And, you know, Colleen, Catherine, you have said, um, we have acknowledgement today that the magnitude and complexity of the issue requires collective action, but we are still not seeing that collective action. Um, so I found so far in, in my research that 
uh, it seems to be also uh, related to the contested nature of, you know, of, of modern slavery that for some stakeholders, I think they will actively, you know, support the labeling of modern slavery, while others may say, you know, this is distracting us from labor exploitation. And that, you know, instead of looking at modern slavery, we should be looking at decent working conditions. So I think this is really at the core of why we are not seeing those collective responses. So there's no agreement on what really is the problem. So, um, you know, that, that there is very difficult that everyone will agree on the type of solution. And um, what, what I see, at least in my research, is that there is this dominant view that modern slavery is something extreme, something exceptional, you know, that it's, it's something abnormal, uh, rather than this endemic feature of our global economy. Um, and, and I think this is associated with also the view that this can be tackled through, you know, business as usual approaches. We just continue, you know, putting more attention in our social responsibility programs, but really nothing is changing uh, at the core, right? Really at the, you know, outsourcing and subcontracting business models that are driving the emergence of uh, modern slavery in supply chains. Now, I wanted to end today also with a more slightly positive, you know, perspective, really, you know, it's not so bleak, maybe there are some positives here. I think we could say that um, understanding is changing. So I think now when, you know, if we look back when the issue was brought to light seven years ago, I think uh, many businesses were considering this is a problem exclu exclusive to global supply chains. I think now there's more recognition that, you know, uh, modern slavery is a problem widespread across the UK. Um, but also there is a, a nuanced understanding now of the profile of victims or survivors um, that, you know, uh, for a long time we were, you know, thinking of them as low skill in migrant workers um, and that, you know, they, they had been trafficked, but often we see that these workers, you know, they are exerting also their agency um, seeking greater freedom and coming to other places uh, in the world where they feel, you know, they will have a better chance. So I think there's understanding on that, and that's influencing, of course, you know, the driving of these responses that are victim or you know uh, survivor focused. And I guess I will just end with this final point on you know um, that that we definitely seeing the rise of critical voices, you know, highlighting that we need more progressive stances on 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 decent work, you know, and and that may lay the ground for collective actions, um, and and that is uh, you know mainly seeking to address this introspective assessment of business models, you know, changing culture. I think, uh, Colin, you alluded to that. Um, professional ethics that I think, you know, often we, we concentrate more on, 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 you know, this is a something extreme, but not really looking at the causes of, of modern slavery. And I guess this is where I see there may be some, you know, uh, some, some ground for, for reaching consensus among stakeholders. But of course, you know, that remains to be seen, uh, those, those responses. Thank you, Colleen. I think you're muted. I am muted. Thank you so much, Gabrielle and Catherine. Um, sorry, I've been trying to um, connect with Keith on WhatsApp, um, and it just seems that he's having difficulty in um, trying to get in. I is saying that he's <laughs> that it's not letting him launch meetings. I'm not sure if either of you on the panel side have some advice as to what we can suggest for him. I can't get out now because I'm on the webinar. And, and what I am gonna suggest if we don't have, if we can't um, help further, uh, what I really would then like to just explore if we can, we'll just have a, a, an opportunity for questions and answers, but, but perhaps also pick up a little bit on what you have been talking about Gabrielle, which is, you know, I think it was a really useful summary and insight again. And I was interested, particularly where you were pulling out the point that, you know, about a modern slavery statement, even if it's better drafted and with higher disclosure, that it doesn't necessarily coincide with high ESG scores. And I don't know if you want to, to talk a little bit more about that, because I think what I do see is, um, that actually disclosure as a whole is often also unconnected, properly connected, shall I say, in companies. And I think it goes to the ownership role and people are having to do disclosure for ESG, CDP, um, GRI, 
uh, companies act reporting and and certainly from our perspective we have been seeing a need for companies to think more holistically about their disclosure and how they tackle that and whether or not that relates to the ESG scoring. So I was very interested in that. And I wondered if you if you wanted to just comment a little bit more around that. And Catherine, if you had any insights into that point as well. Yeah, and, and I would be happy to come back when I have the evidence because you know we're testing our hypothesis. But this is, you know, it's the initial, you know, reading of that data. And we are going to, I guess, disaggregate even a little bit the, the you know whether it's connected to specific um, human rights uh, scores um, you know sometimes uh, issues or crisis or scandals that have emerged in, in maybe other areas not connected to modern slavery but you know that may having some impact but yes I, I completely agree with you there's the issue around you know the coordination element but also that you know many of these things are still like place in different places. There's no one really at the center of the organization coordinating them. And I guess with that, I'm thinking, you know, that what we did with the um, standard 25700, that part of that was really bringing, plugging in where those gaps were, and that the standard in some ways tries to connect the various things that probably some organizations have already in place, you know, whether it's connected to, you know, ethical procurement or corruption or other topics that it's not reinventing the wheel. I think it's more having this holistic per perspective of how do we make sure that um, mm. we are coordinating those steps or those uh, practices, but in a more meaningful way that is not completely disparate things. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and, and Catherine, I don't know if you want to come in, but I, I certainly think that uh, what I've also seen around high disclosure, high quality disclosure and the disconnect is, is a very real example of what's happened with um, British American tobacco, where if you remember, there were some um, indices which brought out and, and they were um, in the top five in terms of rankings for disclosure. And then, you know, it was, I think it was six months later, they were served with a letter before action around a, a court case for, um, failing to pay minimum wages in, in, in certain parts of their supply chain. But there was that connect, disconnect between the disclosure and what was on ground. And, and, and from you know, my own um, experience, I guess, with companies on this, it's really, if you are going to disclose, you, you need to know what your process is behind that. You need to be able to back that up with evidence. Because I think increasingly, if you're going to disclose and you can't do that, you're going to land up in issues around indices, benchmarking, litigation, that side of things. Um, but sorry, Catherine, would you would want to comment on that at all? Um, just to probably echo some of the things to what you're saying, I think, um, I mean, I'd be fascinated, Gabriel, when, once you're uh, ready to share to see what happens with this. I suspect it's similar to what, you, what you're both speculating there in terms of um, this real disconnect between who produces the statement internally mm, and in some of some companies, it's a real personal passion of one particular person that probably drives a lot of this disclosure and a lot of this action. So it's very reliant on that individual um, to really drive this, but they're often within CSR um, parts of the organization that perhaps don't have as much oversight on other parts. Um, I also would be a little cynical around sometimes those high quality disclosures and maybe a little bit of a disconnect of the reality of what's happening on the ground, mm. um, which is what uh, Colleen's alluding to there. Like mm. with the, the garment industry, it was really interesting to see the number of companies that committed to paying a living wage to the supply chains. But then when we looked at the factory level data, um, we found there was still this living wage gap. So I think there is a bit of a disconnect between what's being disclosed. Mm. I wonder, I mean, it's obviously too early to tell, but I'm already thinking follow up research for you, Gabriella, but um, looking at then managing human rights due diligence and seeing the impact mm. of that then on ESG scores, the companies yeah. that are caught by that as that comes up across mm. Europe. Um, but that would be really interesting to see whether that disconnect maybe disappears or maybe it's taken, mm. it's more coordinated and centralised. And yeah, mm. just a point, obviously, this, the, um, the standard that we were working on, I think, is really 
critical for that because it does actually really go through those different roles and responsibilities very thoroughly yeah, uh, to show absolutely. where that responsibility should be, be yes yeah. and actually probably you know overarchingly that that leadership position with the ceo someone at a very senior board level or you know at least as very senior executive member being able to feed back into the board taking some proper ownership around you know what is being said and what is being done really in relation to these things um, you know, there's just so many questions that I think can for arising from what both of you have said that I, you know, that I, you know, we could probably speak for a long time, but, you know, I, I'm wondering, you know, what do you think is driving this increase in modern slavery, Catherine, and, and maybe Gabby, you've also got some thoughts on that, you know. Yeah, um, I said the, the um, increase, the 10 million increase that we saw from 2016 through to 2021, um, there's a few factors that we suspect are driving that. and. I mean, it's no surprise in some ways, like the compounding crises that we've seen over the last few years has definitely led to this increase. Mm. Um, we've seen obviously changes in climate, which is then driving migration, which is then placing people under more um, vulnerable, more perplexing, those who are most vulnerable, becoming more vulnerable to exploitation. Um, we then also saw um, with crises, we know that there's an increase in exploitation as a result of conflict, for example. Um, and then COVID is a huge change in the last few years and uh, that we know led to an increase in, you know, huge job losses, again, migration, which then also led to this, these forms of exploitation. So, yeah, I think that's a real, um, a real, in well, part of the explanation. I will just say, and I can see that, um, that we've uh, been joined. So sorry, I will stop there. But basically, just very quickly, we did with our surveys only able, we're only able to account for a little bit of the impact of COVID-19 because the surveys were done both in 2019, 2020, and then in 2021. So I suspect that increase is actually quite conservative. Yeah, no, thank you very much and fantastic. Welcome, Keith. I'm sorry we've had masses of IT issues, but you're here, sorry. that's lovely. Um, so sorry, Keith, we, we, we carried on because we've got people signed up. So we carried on having the conversation, but we're really pleased that you are able to join us. And, um, you know, something that we haven't talked about, we're waiting for you to come on is also the role of, um, you know, I think business in the rehabilitation of survivors and um, and really addressing that point. Um, um, uh, but I would just, you know, if, if I hand over to you and if you would like to just share a bit of your experience and insights around the issue of, you know, human trafficking, modern slavery and and really, um, you know, what what we need to be looking at out for and be aware of and conscious of um, in in possibly, I guess, our daily lives in what we come across, what we might see as being untoward but also perhaps from a um, business perspective, you know, what can companies be thinking about in, in either managing the risk or possibly thinking too around the rehabilitation? So I'll, I'll hand over to you, Keith. And Hi. we are due to end at half past, but I, I mean, if people would, if you're okay to stay, shall we run on for another five minutes after that? Would that be all right? Thank you. Hi, I'm sorry for the um technical difficulties um around rehabilitation um on a personal note i've seen um it is all very well getting the conviction against traffickers um which usually comes with a substantial amount of conversation um in my personal experiences where i've seen people uh, uh, well one person I can talk about who has a very substantial amount of money given to him, but he was trafficked from the age of 18 to 26 years. Now, in that time, he had no concept on money, no concept on how to look after himself, basically, um, which led him to a path where he used the money for drugs, he used the money for gambling, um, at that time, he was on witness protection, and unfortunately, he, I mean, to me, was let down by witness, witness protection, and he was had to leave where he was settled due to his um, 
ongoing problems. And now he is what we call assisted. Now, if rehabilitation, um, a lot of survivors stay away from that word rehabilitation because um, it sounds like a drug or alcohol or I mean, it's abuse, some sort of substance abuse or gambling, you know I mean? But what people don't realize, rehabilitation is part of when you're trafficked, you're stripped of your humanity, you're stripped of everything that we take for granted now. You're stripped of, and without knowledge in how to budget yourself, how to look after yourself, how to cook, how to clean. Do you know what I mean? It's, this is not addressed at all, do you know I mean, in the um, criminal and law aspect, which I think should be addressed. Um, I have been working on a project project with the um, King's College and the Ellen Bamba. And we've come out with seven core outcomes, including housing, medical care, um, education. That's just three of them. But if we don't have like the foundations of a, a good care system put in place for victims of like um, Monday slavery, the foundation will crack, which will mean the person, the victim, will not become a survivor, probably end up getting re trafficked. Because at the moment, people are, are out there, and because they were maybe brought into the country illegally, um, so they're, they're, they're claiming political asylum, and they're trip fed money um I've, I've known of people that having to go every day to pick up five pounds a day do you know what I mean to me that's just putting them back a step do you know what I mean why and these people they they are educated they are quite clever why are these people not working why aren't you know I mean where they're not allowed due to the area um our, 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 our. but um my view is, I mean, if these people are skills and they're ready to go to work, why can't they go to work? Why can't they seek education instead of being left in limbo and being left to their own devices, which in some cases, their own devices is thinking in their own mind, what, what am I here for? Do you know I mean, I'm no better off than what I was when I was a slave. Now, just because you've been taken out of that environment does not mean that you can't easily fall back into that environment. Um, so rehabilitation, I think it is quite key in knowing if the person is able to look after himself financially, um, know how to budget themselves, know how to cook, clean. Even, I mean, I've even spoke to Colleen about where we have some sort of rehabilitation centre where it would be a safe house as well, where there could be staff on board that are trained in um, looking after uh, survivors and they're they're it, it they're put in safe houses which are usually mixed with different types of su survivors of trafficking um you could have a few well, like a couple of females living in a building full of males now if a female has been sex trafficked for instance I mean, the last thing she wants, that person would want, is like a, a building full of men, do you know what I mean? Um, which needs to be taken into, into consideration because it's not part of, like, it puts more stress on the victim than it does 
I mean, it's an easy fix for the government. I'm going to say, folks, they'll be, they'll be there. They'll be all right. We'll give them a few quid. I mean, so they can get by. But that's not, it's just putting a plaster over what is wrong with this. And to, this, in, this is not going away. Um, hopefully, there will be changes in the future. And hopefully, there will be. Let, I mean, we're not, we'd be fools to think um, where they're going to eradicate, eradicate uh, modern slavery. But to be honest, slavery has been around thousands of years. So if we can slow it down and bring down the figures, I mean, surely that's better than just leaving things as they are now. Um, I don't know what else you wanted me to cover, Colleen. Um, no, I, I mean, I think that's really insightful. Thank you for that, Keith. And, and you know, mm. thank you for, for agreeing to be here with us. You know, no problem. We, we acknowledge that, you know, it's, it's you're giving us your experience and insight is, is really very helpful. Um, mm. You know, I, 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 I am interested by these outcomes and kind of, you know, where that might, you know, how that might grow, um, for example, because there's a lot of, different programs around um, addressing victims of slavery or human trafficking, as you say, different safe houses, um, different different programs that are run in different places. I, I think that they, it, we, it, you know, we were very encouraged to see how um, some businesses are taking a very active role in um, helping to provide um, skill, I mean, to provide work and employment for, mm -hmm. Um, survivors through to bright futures through different programs that way yeah but yeah. i i suspect that that is still very um not very well known and and not much taken up on it i've just written a chapter on businesses mm -hmm. exploiting and rehabilitating victims of of trafficking which is published in a book i can share the link afterwards um a policy public policy book with through st mary's university but mm -hmm. and and through the work there i saw um just how few businesses really are taking this up and and actually possibly also because they don't have the structures in place necessarily yeah. to know how to support a survivor mm -hmm. um and, and I, I don't know I just I don't know if you want to comment on how how this can be sort of pulled together more to achieve these kind of outcomes because I was particularly interested also in in how you view rehabilitation which is not linked to addiction you know mm. that word is it's very powerful because the word rehabilitation as you say is very linked to addictions and, yeah. and being free of them. Yeah. So I, you know, just just commenting on that. I don't know if if you know what what are the next steps around this program that you've been involved in. Um, you know, what can you recommend to businesses who might be listening to our webinar today in terms of thinking around employment and 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 that side of things? Yeah, um, I've also been involved in the last two years in um, the. Uh, British Standards Institute uh, Modern Day Slavery Standard, um, which is actually a free document. Now, the, for the British Standards to do to put out a document like this and to have it free, there's no excuse from a multi-billion pound or dollar business or a corner shop let's say, with one employee. I mean, um, these guidelines, we're hoping to introduce them as we take for granted health and safety. And hopefully this is the way forward in making this, with making this standard is cutting down on um, people falling into the trap of being trafficked, or you know, protecting, um, say, migrant workers, where other companies may take advantage of them. So 
with with the British standards being free, there's no need to. I mean, you haven't got to spend hundreds of thousands on documents. Do you know what I mean it's up to the the business to look for this document? And do you know I mean, it, as I said, it's free, so there's no excuse why we can't move on from mm. business in in the in this way. Mm. I, I I think that's right. I mean, um, Gabby, or yes, Gabby, did you want to come in? Yeah, just uh, wanted to add. Uh, now that you know, Keith is mentioning the standard and and that it's free, and you know that there's no excuse now. Um, that also is fair to say that you know it's it's a big piece. And Colleen, you said you know it's it's a long guidance document, but I yeah. don't think companies should find this daunting. I think it's more the opportunity to say, well, you know, where are we in our journey of modern slavery? Is it you know, is it that we're really at the beginning and we will. We're going to use the standard as a way of, you know, mapping all the things that we need to be aware of, you know, and, and really outlining what are our <coughs> priorities. But it may be also for other organizations that are more already, you know, they, they may have a policy already, they may have some training. How do you uh, compare to best practices out there? And those that are really advanced, I guess it's more like a sounding board, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it can be used very flexibly and, and, and depending on, on organization's journey. I totally Thanks. agree there with you, Gabriel. I don't know if you um, wanted to comment on anything that um, was said by Keith, um, Catherine. I think, um, I mean, you said many important things. I think one thing that really struck me is, which people might not realize is that people in the UK going through the national referral mechanism can't always work. Um, and it's, I mean, it's awful for many reasons, but I think it's something that's really important for us. And, and a, a really simple, in some ways, policy ask of the government to say actually providing the right to work for those going through the NRM is fantastic in terms of, you know, providing jobs for people, uh, fantastic in terms of that rehabilitation, for want of a better way, of, a better word, and then also, you know, fills job gaps. So I think there's a, there's a real important piece for me, a take, key takeaway that, is one thing that we'll definitely put into our advocacy around the importance of the right to work. Yeah, and, and if I can comment on that, you know, a number of years ago, I met a group of survivors. We were actually demonstrating and in front of Dan Downing Street to get the legislation extended around survivor protection. And, um, and it was, I don't know how to, just, I don't know what you, word to use for the day because it was a such a mix of emotions. You know, I had the opportunity to hear a lot of stories of people who were who were caught in the asylum system, and one particular young woman um, I, I've kept in touch with and kind of watched the journey of how difficult it is and has been for her to manage this waiting period. You know, skilled educated young girl who'd fallen foul of trafficking and had so much to offer and and just re the reality is that you know there is that enormous gap and and people kind of left in limbo because there's nobody really dealing with it and and i do think the other thing that i see more and more of is that there are some incredible programs around providing some confidence and skill sets to um to different groups of survivors so so i've just become a trustee of it's called the bramber bakehouse Fund, foundation and they are they um, provide cooking skills for female survivors in sussex but there is the next step for them is really that connection into places where they require the woman to be able to do this to to do the cooking the chefs the baking the commercial side so, so um so i'm really excited because they've asked me to help me do some of their thinking but i think if more if there was a more holistic adoption around these things which is what i think keith is saying you know let's let's think about this in in terms of you know the reality for survivors the needs for business the, the the, and actually all of it comes down to you know real responsibility doesn't it you know mm -hmm. in in all sectors of society definitely so oh gave you another question just to add that um 
we need to recognize that it's going to take courage also from companies because this is about leadership and ethical leadership that raises above the current, let's be honest, rhetorical um, government rhetoric. So I think, you know, it, it's going to be, I can see why we are lacking those steps, you know, that, that, that are seeking to protect victims and survivors. But I think this is a great opportunity for companies to really, um, you know, act upon and, and, and become leaders in, in, in the provision mm, of this. I agree. And, and actually on that point as well, I think that, you know, we need to see leadership in government too. We need to see some real action around this in, in terms of the, um, what's needed to address migrant workers, refugees, the rhetoric. We, I mean, we haven't got time to really go into that, but, but there's courageous leadership, I think, needed in so many places to address this. And, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, if I may say so, Keith, you know, this is a real, you know, a, a, for, for a real courageous step that you've taken and you know the work that you and the experience that you're now bringing to this it's we you know we recognize that's no small thing no it's like if you were if you were to to say to me five years ago i'd be um involved in discussions like this i probably wouldn't i mean wouldn't have entertained it wouldn't have entertained it at all um Fortunately, I met with um, the Survivors Alliance UK, um, Min Dang, um, when she's, um, who is the CEO of the company, of the charity. And we are, I mean, we had almost pushed um, to speak to professionals. Um, it's about building your own self-esteem your own um person you I mean you're not just a victim you're not just a survivor i mean you're just you're a professional in what you've learned over being a victim do you know I mean so to be involved in projects like this i think is par paramount that we continue um as survivors being part of meetings like this. Yeah, no, when we really appreciate that. So thank you. Um, I am conscious of time. I am going to unfortunately have to stop this. I, it's been such an insightful and really interesting conversation. Um, you know, each of you, Gabby, Catherine, Keith, thank you. I really appreciate your no time problem. and your insights. And um, somebody asked if this is being recorded, it will be, it is recorded, it will be available afterwards, we'll get to try and get it on our website early next week. Um, but, you know, do, um, do stay in touch with us if you want to know more, there's always things that, um, and from an audio perspective, we share news, we, we put things into newsletters, we, we will continue with a webinar program um, next year. Um, along the lines of um, due diligence, corporate responsibility, um, but we, um, we 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 are hoping to run a specific podcast series around um, responses around modern slavery, and um, and so we'll let people know once we've got that slightly more formulated. So thank you very much, everybody, and um, and have a good weekend, and have a blessed Christmas or a festive holiday season so, thank, thank, thank you everyone. thank you everyone thank you everyone thank you everyone thank you